Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Ranch Church. We are here to love Jesus together, to love our neighbor, to love our God with all of our hearts, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, to learn from his scriptures, to be changed deep inside, to experience tremendous transformation, and to overcome every obstacle. That's why we gather here right now. God is on the move. He's on the move in your heart. He's on the move in your life. And I'm very excited to share Jesus Christ with you. We're now going to stop and pray and worship. And I want you to, I want you to soak in many good things of God. Listen, right behind me, I'm, I'm broadcasting this right now from our global world headquarters here at the Ranch Church. As we affectionately like to say. And it's gorgeous here, 62 acres of absolute beauty and glory. But I'm here to tell you that God is doing even greater things in your life, even more beautiful things, more wonderful things inside your life. So we're going to pray, going to be in Romans chapter 3, and you're going to love what we have to share from the Word of God today. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, come for us now, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and do miracles inside our hearts. We pray that you would be lifted up. I pray for my friends, every single person listening, bless them now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship. Here in our joy, here in our sorrow, there in our past, there in tomorrow, here in our wine, here in our drinking, there in our bread, there in our breaking, you're always with. You're always with us. You're always with us. You're always with us. Even in fear, even in fire, even in faith, walking on water, even in doubt, even denying, even in life, even in dying, you're always with us. No power of 
with us You're always with us, God Always with us, God You're the light in the darkness We can't see the way the voice in the thunder whenever we're afraid you're with us God you're with us God you're the hand that's reaching out we've drawn our final breath Always with us, God. Never leave us. Now we will sing with all that's within us in all of our lives. You're always with us. Now we will sing. With all that's within us, through all of our lives, you're always with us. You're always with us. You're always with us. With us. You're always with us. This is a thin place This is where you meet with us This is sacred space This is where you meet with us This is a thin place This is where you meet with This is sacred space This is where you meet with This is a thin place. This is where you meet with us. This is sacred space. This is where you meet with us. Just by 
Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. I'm going to handle this chapter in two parts, and it's really the same subject matter. I have a very interesting title for you that I think you're going to love. What if God sends you to court? I mean, what if the Lord Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, he who will judge the living and the dead, according to his righteousness, what if God were to send you to court. Now, at first, I think we would ask the question, what have I done wrong? What have you done wrong? And perhaps you would have some pushback to some degree related to morality. Hey, listen, I've done this, I've done that. Uh, quickly, people sometimes like to say, well, I'm a tither, I'm a giver. Uh, others like to talk about the time, which is certainly legitimate in God's kingdom and economy. Look at all the ministries I've done, the things I've participated, maybe kids ministry. Uh, maybe missions, maybe in my parking lot crew at this or other churches, whatever the case is, maybe you would have some sort of pushback to try and share with God, what have I done? Why are you taking me to court? Now, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. I personally have never really been taken to court. The few times that I've been to court have been more in my youthful days which were quite foolish related to speeding tickets, which I hate to confess, and uh, putting that pedal to the metal. But other people find themselves in courts for very, very serious offenses. 
And I'm here to tell you that God is now going to walk you through something that you might not understand very well, something that might be difficult to internalize related to Romans chapter 2. The latter part of Romans chapter 1, Paul is going to mention the uncircumcised heart. Here he's talking about Judaism. And he's going to compare and contrast those, especially in chapter 3, he's going to call it the oracles of God. Maybe some of your translations call it the word of God. He's going to say, okay, well, you, those of you that have the Bible, I mean, some of you, you know, you grew up in church. You know, you if you're if you're more into a structured denominational church, it's sometimes called a catechism. You know, you grew up in some sort of structured environment in church. You had this, you had this, you had the oracles of God. How to go? And then others, you know, are 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 not at all in that world. They're completely far from that. And so that's the Jew Gentile teaching that Paul is getting after, and he's going to poke really hard at the Jew, which is very much like poking very seriously and deeply at a Christian who attends church. At those people that would call themselves Christ followers, those who would say that they're actually holding on to the Word of God, he's going to say, you know, let's, let's pause for a few moments. And what if God were to take you to court? What if we were to put you in a court of law, and the Apostle Paul was the prosecutor? Think about that. And Paul's going to say, you know, circumcision relating to that right, and even baptism in the New Testament, circumcision in the old, baptism in the new. Circumcision, the Apostle Paul is going to say, is actually a matter of the heart. So you can have the physical act of circumcision done to you, and yet sin can get you, and really absolutely make that circumcision physical act absolutely nothing and in the same way in the new testament you can be baptized you can be held down under the waters and you can be washed and shaken you can be baptized over and over and over and over again but sin can actually make that baptism absolutely nothing so these are the things that paul the Apostle Paul is talking about. Now, let me just let me just give you a little tongue in cheek here. All right, so I think you're gonna like this. I think you're gonna really like this. One of the very last lines of the Apostle Peter, Second Peter, the very last book of the second book with his name on it. Peter has something that I and I just love this about the apostles. I mean, I love this about Scripture. I find this in so many different places of the Bible. But here it is. Peter will be mentioning Paul generally. And he's going to say, Paul writes some things that are hard to understand. So what Peter is saying is that Paul sometimes writes words that actually give me a headache. And I just can't stop laughing about just just the honesty of them. And the, uh, the, the sincere communication. You have to know these men. Paul is a scholar. And Peter's this businessman, Peter's this get it done guy, like we're just gonna get stuff done and we're gonna make money and we're gonna run a profitable business and we're gonna lower, we're gonna make sure that we work away around taxes and we're gonna we're gonna get away with it, we're gonna scheme a little bit in that sense. And here's Paul the scholar, you know, the PhD. And Peter's saying, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I just want you to know that when Paul writes certain things, sometimes he gives me a headache. And so if he gives you a headache, it'd be hard to understand. Just know the same thing for me. And I'm the apostle. All right. So, so pretty cool. So we're going to run through the very first eight verses as one section and then nine and on through the second one as we look at a two-part series here. What if God were to send you to court? And so Paul's going to open up now in chapter three, and he's going to say, then what advantage has the Jew? I already referenced that. What advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Now, at first, you would be prone to think that what Paul's going to say is nothing. In other words, if you got circumcised in faith according to the Old Testament, or you got baptized, let's say, in the New, and it didn't work. In other words, you did these things, and sometimes this definitely happens. In terms of the new covenant, some people get physically baptized and they go the very next hour or day or whatever the case is and they sin like hell. So what's that all about? So you might think that the knee-jerk reaction would be to say that there's no value to it, but that's not what Paul says. 
He's not throwing scripture under the bus and he's not throwing away the entirety of the Old Testament. He says much in every way. In other words, they're tremendously valuable because they're sacred and holy. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. That would be the word of God. What if some were unfaithful? Okay, so that's exactly what we're talking about. What happens if you claim to have faith and you've gone through some sort of spiritual exercise? You at church on Sundays and even now I will ask for altar calls. And so that is the idea that believing that as we're preaching here the word of God, there must be a response from God's people. There must be. It could be praise. It could be excitement. Yes and amen and, and, and lots of enthusiasm and lots of agreement. It could be repentance. You know what? I need to alter the course of my life. I need to change something. I need to get right. Uh, I need to come home. It, it usually needs to be done in some sort of public expression. So you come publicly forward to faith. And so that's what he's saying. Because So let's say you do all of that. And you go right afterwards. And again, you use the phrase, you go out and you sin like hell. But what about God? What if some were unfaithful? Does this nullify, does this faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. By no means at all. So let God be true, though every one is a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. So let me just pause there and, and give you sort of an overarching sort of theme to grab hold on. And it's this, God is greater than your sin. That's some of the best news I could ever tell you about. And I got really good news for you today. God is greater than your sin, but, and theologians like to call that the blessed but, but you are sinful. You must be saved and delivered from your sin. You must be released from the bondage of your sin. And I've got really good news for you related to that. Continuing on now, as we look at this phrase, in your Bible it will be set off to the side, this phrase in verse 4, but uh, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. That is a reference really fascinating. When you do a deep dive in Paul's teaching out of the book of Romans, he doesn't always let you know who it is, but he's referencing David. And this is a direct reference to Psalm 51, verse 4, where David is confessing his sin of Bathsheba. He's, he's really going through a spiritual lament. He's, he's sharing with you the gold that he learned from his sin. Nasty, deep sin. In one sinful event, he broke all ten commandments. He broke, actually, 660 more. He broke the entire Old Testament law, all in one single event. So profound is that in the, in the New Testament, when it's referencing Jesus, this is in Matthew chapter 1, it's, it's the genealogy of Jesus. It says that David's wife, you know, it's going to mention Bathsheba. You know, what the, you know what the parenthesis is there? It says the wife doesn't actually say that Solomon is, it says his son, but Bathsheba, it says, was really not David's wife. It says that she was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. I mean, that's how profound that moment was. King David, the favored child of God, and the favor that rested on King David in the new covenant is actually the favor that is promised upon you, which is why you have to listen to this message, which is why you have to embrace God is greater than your sin, but you actually are sinful and must be delivered from your sin. Now, I'm just going to read out Paul's explanation from there. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God's unrighteous, that God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? In other words, so if somehow my doing wrong helps God's grace do more right, then what's the problem? Right, that's what he's going to work through. By no means. He's saying, I speak in a human way, by no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? Again, he's rhetorically asking the same question. 
And why not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously, slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. In other words, I referenced Second Peter, saying that Peter is saying, Paul's words are hard to understand. But do you know what Peter is saying there by way of context? He's saying that because some of Paul's words, as he's explaining the Old Testament, like right here in Romans chapter 3, because some people have a hard time with grace, because some people have a hard time with the intelligence of the faith, that they actually take Paul's words and they twist them. So even though Peter's having a little fun with Paul there, he's defending him, as he's defending all scripture in 2 Peter. And he's saying, do not do this. Do not do this at all. Just because Paul's words might for a moment in your immaturity, maybe even in your sinfulness, be hard to understand, do not twist them. That will not go well for you or anybody else. So God is greater than your sin. Praise the Lord for that. I mean, be excited for that. That means that there's no negativity that you have to be enslaved to. There's no addiction that is, needs to be the story of your life. Nothing. Nothing like that. No sinful pattern. You can enjoy Christ's victory from the cross every single moment of your life. It's really profound. But Paul is going to go a little farther, excuse me, as uh, in verse 9, and he's going to go farther. And he's now going to really, this is like the takedown. This is really the takedown. And he's going to reference, I'm going to give you these references here. He's going to reference, and he's going to put a bunch of different verses together. He's going to put one, two, three, four, five, six, six different verses together. He's going to put Psalm 14, Psalm 5, 9, Psalm 140, Psalm 10, 7, Isaiah 59, verse 7. And he's going to go back to Psalm 36, verse 1. He's going to take these six references. He's going to put them all together. And he's going to say, this, this is the problem. And so here's how Paul says it. Verse 9, he says, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we've already charged that all, both the Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. And so, Paul, secondly, in the first part, I told you that God is greater than your sin. In this next part, sin is a serious disease. And just parenthetically, God's not fooling around with it. That's why Jesus had to go to the cross. That'll be the second part. Remember, we're talking about a court of law. And, and there are some people in a court of law who are, they're, they're, so, they're so overcome with their circumstances, they actually are silly. You know, there's a court of law, and they have, to, they have to really do the right things, but they're being very silly with the accusations. And there are some people actually in prisons that when you ask them, and it's been proven and proven and proven, they're guilty for their crime. They're doing hard time. It's sad but true. And you ask him, what about your offense? And they say, no, I didn't do anything wrong. You know, the judge got the wrong attorney. Okay, yeah, but did you do it? Are you guilty of that charge? No. And so Paul is going to say, God is telling you that sin is actually a serious disease. Now, these are all of those verses put together in one. And I tend to think that this is actually what the Apostle Peter was referencing when he was saying sometimes Paul's words are a little hard. So here they are put together. None is righteous, no, not one. That's pretty easy to understand. No one understands. Okay, that's a little convicting. Say no one understands God. No one seeks for God. No one seeks for God. I thought we're listening to this. Aren't you, aren't you now seeking God as we're reading? We're just reading the Bible. We're preaching the gospel. Didn't you just click on to this channel? Aren't you involved in what we're saying? Am I not actually preaching to you right now? Have I not studied the word of God and served him? So how is it possible that no one seeks for God? Let me explain that because it's one of the most profound and beautiful things I've ever discovered. To you and I, it seems like we are seeking God. But that's not really true. The deeper truth is God is calling us. 
that God has actually been looking after you and he has been coming for you. And he is the one who's actually grabbing you and pulling you to himself. To you and I, subjectively, it feels like we're seeking God. We're not seeking God. He's got us. He's housed us as Jesus taught in John in his hands. This is the, no one can take us out of the Father's hands. He's actually drawing us to him. So he says as he combines these verses of Old Testament scripture, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Their throat, now get this, is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. I don't think you're going to fight with that at all. If you doubt this, then just know that really what we're describing here is things on your phone, on the internet, on search engines, on social media. People deceiving with their tongues all day long. The venom of asps is under their lips. That is related to a snake and the fangs and how they grab on. And I'm sure you like all kinds of different animal channels. And I've seen some where they have venomous and non-venomous snakes and they're, they're smaller, but, you know, they're clamped on to somebody's hand. They're just hanging on their hand. And, you know, I'm watching it at home, especially when my boys were younger. We're like, oh, my goodness, look at that. You know, it's so crazy. That's a really good picture of what's being spoken of here. Their mouth, their, the venom of asp, excuse me, is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And in their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. Well, oh, that's true. That's what sin will do. There's no fear of God before their eyes. So, Sin is a dear, serious disease. God's not fooling around. But here's some of the great news. Here's some of the really good news. That God in Christ Jesus can save you by grace. Everything that's being described here by the Apostle Paul and everything that's being described by Scripture itself says that you and I are not deserving of salvation. I know that to be true of my life. There is nothing I did of any great virtue. And there is nothing I could have done of any great virtue to deserve my salvation, to actually deserve God coming for me in human flesh and being tortured and die on the cross for my sin so that I can live without sin being dominated in my life. But in Christ, grace will actually save you. And so to end it now, he says, but now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So there's no way religious people can actually be saved through their religious faith in the ritualistic nature of works. It is only through the power of Jesus on the cross by way of faith through grace. So some good news. We are sinning, according to this text that we looked at here, with our head related to our desires. We're sitting with our heart, excuse me, with our desires. We're sitting with our head because we have stinking thinking. And we're sitting with our hands and feet by what we do. But here is what's guaranteed to make you happy. This is guaranteed to make you happy. And it's absolutely not deserved. But it is an absolute gift to you and I that we need to receive and celebrate and be so happy about. That Jesus actually has full payment for your sin. That's first and foremost. Secondly, he has absolute total forgiveness for your sin. And third, he has freedom from sin for you. So you have payment of sin, forgiveness of sin, and freedom from sin. This is what you have here in this chapter, in this teaching. So in the court of law, the Apostle Paul comes as God's prosecutor. And he looks at you. And he looks at your thought life. Uh Uh-oh. And he looks at my thought life. He says, guilty. And he looks at your desires. Guilty. And he looks at what you actually say with your mouth. 
Yeah, okay, let's just give it up right now. Guilty. And he looks what you actually do. Not what you say, but what you actually do. Guilty. All of that. The Apostle Paul is a prosecutor of God. He declares you guilty. But now, now comes your defender. 1 John chapter 2 calls him the advocate. Now in that court of law, you have the Apostle Paul on one side. And now you are actually on the other. In front of you is the judge. But you have an advocate. 1 John chapter 2 says, the man Christ Jesus, who stands up and says, is he actually guilty of sinful desires? The judge says, boom, guilty. Jesus says, I have paid the full price for his sinful desires. Paul, so Paul says, he's guilty of, of saying all kinds of sinful things. Up stands the man, Christ Jesus, your advocate, once again, who says, I have paid the penalty for everything this man or woman has ever said and done. And then the Apostle Paul, boom, says to, to the judge, but he's also, this man, this woman is actually guilty of what they have actually done sinfully against you, God as Father, and Jesus, your advocate, once again stands up and says, but I have paid the penalty and price for everything they have ever done. And the judge says, well, that price has been paid. Go be saved, my friend. Sin no more. And so you get now through the cross of Jesus Christ, absolute total acceptance. Inside your body, inside your mind, inside your soul. So my friend, is this not great news? You must respond to this. I'm going to pray and ask that Jesus just come into your life and that there be the boldest of all bold celebrations, the joyful of all joyful salvation inside your heart. Join me in prayer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, I pray now, God, that we would celebrate your great and marvelous saving work and that you would save my friends now. So repeat after me, Lord Jesus, say it out loud. I need you. Say that definitely out loud. Lord Jesus, I need you. Save me and I will be saved. Love me, heal me, forgive me. For you are now my God, my Savior, and my friend. Seal me now in your love, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Can you shout amen? Of course you can shout amen. Amen. You can know that if you prayed that prayer, that's a miracle. And that Christ is sealing you now, and he will never leave you, never forsake you. Listen, I want to know more about you. I need to know more about you. You need to go to ranchchurch.com. And there is a contact us button right on that landing page. You click on that. You let me know who you are. I will send you a Bible. I will send you materials. I will send you some love in the mail. It's all free. And I want to know who you are. I want to pray for you. I want to celebrate the miracle working life of Jesus Christ. I want to baptize you. I want to hear your story. I want to love on you. I want to celebrate the miracle of God in your life. Listen. This channel exists, our church exists, and Christians exist because we love God. We love being givers. We're givers here at the Ranch Church because we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to go to ranchchurch.com slash give, and I want you to tithe. Tithe. Watch God bless your finances in the most powerful and special ways. We make no apology. We, we bought this 62-acre farm by which to preach the gospel by tithing and raising $2.25 million in 90 days. It's a miracle. So do that, my friends. Watch God do great things in your finances, in your personal life. I love you so much. Go in peace, love, and serve Jesus. I'm going to give you part two next week. In Jesus' name, amen.